If you have your Bible, get them out. We're going to be in the book of Colossians once again. We'll be going verse by verse, pass by passage through the book of Colossians. We're going to finish up chapter 2 this morning. We have a pretty long passage, uh, but all the concepts kind of go together. It'll be pretty easy. Uh, it's Colossians chapter 2, 16 through 23. And what Paul is doing is he's addressing some false teaching, some false teaching we actually might see in the church today. And he's really going to address four things throughout this letter, and he highlights them all here in chapter 2. The one that we spent two weeks on was on this idea of elite uh, human philosophy, or what we might call humanism today, or humanistic thinking today. That's where we, on our own, we kind of figure out life. We might figure out who God is, or we come to a, a higher state of knowledge, or we come to a deeper knowledge. And the whole idea is that based on our intelligence, we figure things out, but there's then a level because the more intelligence I have, that means I'm then greater than you are, I'm smarter than you, I'm greater than you. That's elite human philosophy, and that had crept into the church. There's three more that we're actually going to address this morning. The second one is ritualistic legalism. We'll start off there. That's where you know you're good with God, or you know you're good with society based on what you do. Uh, if you follow certain rules, if you follow certain regulations, if you tick off the box the right way, you're either good or bad or better or lesser than. So that's legalism. Then we'll look briefly at experiential mysticism that had crept into the church. That's where you have... Uh, an emphasis of, of encounters or an emphasis of personal prop prophecies or an emphasis of you saw angels or an emphasis of your personal experience. And we'll see how that's affected the church because the more experiences you have, that would mean the more spiritual you are. And then the third one we'll look at, the fourth one total, is what we call personal asceticism. It's just a really fancy word that means you deprive yourself of things. So the more pain you go through, the more that you give up, the more harm that you cause to yourself, that shows how serious you are in your spirituality or how serious you are in what you think. And then all these are methods of gaining a higher level of spirituality that are out in the world during the days of Paul and that are probably still out today. Like in the last two weeks, we looked at this idea of human philosophy, where mankind has the answer to everything, and we challenged that with the identity that the world has in humanism to the identity that we have in Christ, and we saw that those two are quite contrasting. And what Paul says is, hey, look, you as a believer, you're a brand new creation. He said last week you've been spiritually circumcised, a very visual image, he says, your debt, all that stuff that was stacked up that's been obliterated, has been blown to smithereens, and Satan has no power over you. So live, uh, stay focused on Christ and the things that you are because you know you have Christ because of Christ, because what Christ has done, we can live differently. Now, our goal this morning is we're going to talk a lot about dangerous distractions and then the danger of these distractions. What can happen if we get distracted? All found in this long section. I'm going to read this passage together. Uh, whatever version you have, you read along in the same way. Beginning in verse 16, Paul writes, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he's seen, inflated without cause by his fleshy mind, and not holding fast to the head from, which, uh, from whom the entire body, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with the growth which is from God. If you've died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments of teachings of men. These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Now, again, in context, these are things that have crept into the church in Colossae and might even creep into our churches today. Human philosophy had captured them. Uh, they started to worship angels. 
they begun to bring bad theology in the church and had bad teaching, things that were competing with the appropriate view of Christ. And really his response goes back to verse 9. We saw this last week where multiple times you have this emphatic in him. And the in him is contrast with anything that's not in him. Any objection, any philosophy, any alternative that's not in him would be improper. The in him trumps everything that's on our list of these four aspects. Now in verse 16, we start this passage or section about judging. And he mentions food and drink and festivals. He mentions a new moon and Sabbath, a bunch of things that people are doing. And Paul's now going to address that second way, the idea of the misleading ways of legalism. Now just start off with a definition of legalism. Legalism is the idea that you have to do or not do certain things as a way to earn or merit salvation. So it's by our human efforts or good works. So basically what you do guarantees who you are with God or what you do or have done or not done gives you an evaluation of I'm better than certain people or less than certain people by my actions. But it all comes back to the individual. How hard do they work? And that's a really dangerous teaching because it's a formula that is not biblical. It starts with I did this. And the moment you put I... That means the focus is not on him, which is supposed to be all about. Further, if it's all about legalism and what you do, you never know if you actually do enough. I mean, maybe you just missed it by one. Oh, that's too bad. Maybe you were close, but not close enough. Uh, And that will lead to a life of insecurity. That will lead to a life of questioning and wondering. And it's here where groups have come along and they go, we're going to help you, right? Right? Maybe being part of churches like that. They'll say something like, well, I tell you what, if you just come up and you confess one sort of issue, we'll tell you what you need to do in order to get right. And what that happens is that develops very proud people because it points to themselves as the answer or the church is the answer. Let me get you right. Let me make sure you're okay. And we shove our standards onto other people. Remember what the believers have done in Colossae. So they've replaced their focus on Christ with a refocus on something that isn't in him. And so we're going to talk about these dangerous distractions, things that take our focus off of Christ that might even happen today, Uh, not in our church, of course, but I'm sure in somebody else's church. Uh, The first dangerous distraction would be that the Christian life is a formula. In other words, this is about doing or not doing. If we follow these one, three, five steps, then we know we're great. We're a disciple. We're a great Christian. God loves us based upon what we do. Now, the problem is the things themselves can actually be good things. But if we treat them as a formula without the focus on the person of Christ, that's when we get in trouble. And the world loves their formulas. There are 12-step programs. There's recovery programs. There's marriage courses, parenting courses. There's formulas for finance, formulas for savings, formulas for getting out of debt. All step-by-step formulas that teach us to get from one place to the next. Again, I'm not saying the programs themselves are necessarily bad, but they can become a distraction if they replace our focus on Christ. In the Colossae, they had some distractions, and it was around legalism, what you do. And look at some of the list of things. There was legalism about what they could eat and what they couldn't eat. So there's a regulation of the food intake that you have. There were demands on, on how they worship, what they were supposed to do or not do. It mentions a new moon festival. In Israel, every time there was a new moon, there was a special sacrifice set up. Uh, There was a big holiday. There's no work allowed, and so you had a special festival for every new moon. During the time of Moses, Israel had special regulations that they were supposed to do to, to help them understand that they were set apart from God. But what happened is the church grabbed things that they saw elsewhere, and they pulled them into the church and they made them part of their daily life and made them legalistic for the church. What's interesting is the five things mentioned in verse 16, all of them had their source in Judaism. And the church had taken those and shoved them into the church as a way to show that they were spiritual, as a way to show that they were spiritually mature. And some of them could be a matter of of preference. So again, the things themselves aren't the issue. It's the weight that they placed on them and they become a distraction to these believers. And look, we, we do the same thing today. We have our, what we'll call sacred cows that we have in the church that we elevate sometimes to a place where they can be a distraction. 
I get frustrated. There's actually books that come out there for pastors that have the 52 weeks of sermons that you can get there. And there's a theme for every Sunday. And you end up having Scouts Day and Mother's Day and Grandparents Day and Father's Day and Homecoming Sunday and Graduation Sunday and Compassion Sunday and Gideon Sunday. And you have a Sunday for everything where the sermons are all right there. Again, I'm not saying those events or celebrating things is necessarily the issue. But when your focus becomes a celebration or the highlight of something rather than the Word of God, that can be a distraction. And it has in so many churches today that have gotten distracted easy. So there's a danger in this idea of the Christian life as a formula, and that is we begin to judge ourselves and others based on the program. That's what he says at the beginning of verse 16. There's a judgment on what they're doing or they're not doing. They've determined spiritual or unspiritual or good or bad, all a works-based judgment. There's never a mention of the motivation of the heart here. There was never a, an aspect of, are they yielding to Christ? There was never an aspect of discipleship or spiritual growth. It's you're good or you're bad based upon how you tick this box in Christianity. And Paul says in verse 17, the things they're doing are a mere shadow of the object. It's like you're close, but it's not the real thing. It's not about the doing. It's about the being. It's not about what you do. It's about the person. See, doing should be an outflow of being. Your fellowship with Christ should have an outflow in what you do. It's, it's like becoming obsessed with a photograph that some people might have today on their phone of Tay-Tay, Taylor Swift. And I know people who are so obsessed with Taylor Swift, the first, I think, billion-dollar musician. She just crossed over that billion dollars. Crazy. And I know people who look at Tay-Tay all the time, almost every day, and they talk to Tay-Tay. And they enjoy Taylor Swift, and that's all they listen to is Taylor Swift. They, they are just obsessed with Taylor Swift. But what would happen if Taylor Swift were to come in the back door, right? You're so distracted with your photograph, she's in the back door waiting for you just to turn around, and she would happily greet you with a hug and sing a song with you, I don't know. But you're so obsessed with your phone, you stare at it, you can't get away from this object, which is a mere shadow of Tay-Tay. And if you just slow down for a moment... And turn around, you could have fellowship with Taylor Swift. Now, legalism does the exact same thing. It is a shadow of the mere object we're supposed to focus on. We get all encompassed in what we're doing, how uh, what I'm doing makes me feel good, and what I'm doing means I'm a good believer, and what I'm doing, what I'm doing, what I'm doing, instead of who I am and who he is. See, it's our being and who he is that's much more important with our doing. So we have to be careful. We could get distracted. A second distraction, not just legalism mentions here, is that, well, what about experiential mysticism? The Christian life is about your experience. That's what we're going to emphasize. A mystic is a person who believes that through either personal contemplation or meditation or blanking your minds, that spiritual things and revelation occurs. So a person should have regular personal visions, personal prophecies, encounters with angels, because these supernatural experiences, though only based on a personal experience, are the secret to showing how spiritual that you are. Now, it's interesting. We have conversations with these type of people. They love to talk about their experience. And the challenge is you can't argue with them because you're not part of their experience. And the thing about the Christian life being an experience is you want to be around a spiritual leader then that claims to have some pretty good experiences, who claims that they have seen and experienced certain things. And I've seen these type of teachers and leaders claiming that they have raised the dead. I knew of one who said that he saw an organ angel and had an esky with a heart inside it spiritually, and that all he had to do was give that heart spiritually to someone else, and they would be healed physically. And people line up. They want to hear their experiences that happened not just a few months ago right up here on the coast at the Jesus Revival area where they had a man who supposedly had raised people from the dead. And if you left Chancellor Church and drove by there, you would see it packed out like crazy because people wanted to know, oh, an experience because the experience was highlighted. Paul gives a warning in verse 18. He says, if the emphasis is on experience, they are defrauding you. 
It's a word that's written in the present tense. It means they've been defrauding you in the past, and they're defrauding you right now, and you bought it hook, line, and sinker. It's like going to a state of origin game, and the Maroons have reached the, the ball across the line to score a try. It's obvious they won the game at the last second, and yet the Blues, obviously, officials have gotten together. And though the evidence is obvious, they come back and they go, no try, the Blues wins. They defrauded us, like I'm sure they've done before. See, the word Paul is using is a strong word. He goes, this is obvious. How can you get caught up in this experience? And that's what you're highlighting rather than the person. The word used here is the strongest word he can use. That you're distracted and your focus is not on him. You're being defrauded. You're being manipulated. It's obvious. How can you let that happen? And here lies the danger. If it's about experience, then we keep seeking a new experience. See, if you're about growing as a believer and it's not reading scripture, if it's not Christ growing through us through trials, it's about experience. So we have to continue to learn some new special way. We speak in a new special way. We have to see a vision in a new special way, and we're focused on the wrong thing. It says you're being robbed then of your spiritual progress. And look how far the believers in Colossae took it. Instead of focusing on him, since the spiritual world was so intriguing, since it was so being highlighted, they began to worship angels thinking they needed to pray to angels, and they needed angels to help them navigate through life. And look, I've heard story after story. You probably have two of an angel who saved someone from a car smash or seen bumper stickles, angels on board on the back of a car. Paul's not bashing the role of angels, which, by the way, do the works of the one who sent them, which is the Father. Paul's saying, why in the world would you highlight a simple messenger rather than focusing on the one who sent the messenger. Why not focus on Christ? And rarely have I ever been in a conversation where someone goes, oh, I had this experience with an angel, when lo and behold, someone else pipes up, and they had an experience too. And before long, you have a, a one-upsman on their angel experiences. Again, I'm not bashing whether you had an angel experience or not, but it's rare. It's rare that I've ever been in a conversation of anyone who's had any sort of supernatural weird experience, dying and going to heaven, whether it's an angel experience where they said, look, I don't exactly know what happened here, but I am closer to God, and this is what I can tell you about my relationship with Christ now. Usually the emphasis is on the experience rather than on Christ, who if the experience is real, caused the experience. See the difference? If you've really had those experiences, your relationship with Christ should be that much stronger, should be that much better, and that's what you're encouraging, not encouraging selling your books about your experience. It's a difference. Again, this is not about the validity of the work of an angel. This is not about the validity of things that happen in life. It is, are you closer to Christ because of that? Are you more focused on him? And Paul says in verse 18, instead, what happens is they got it inflated. Because they had this experience and you didn't means that I'm better than you because I had an experience you didn't have. Have you ever been around someone who had an experience and you go, oh man, alive, they had that happen to them? I don't feel very spiritual now. Why didn't I have an experience like that? And before long, our focus is off of Christ and we're seeking for something that is new. And Paul says it's about fellowship. Fellowship with your Savior. It's not about experience that matters. Look at verse 19. It goes, those who are seeking a new experience, it actually promotes disharmony. If you hold fast to an experience over the in him, he's actually saying you're out of fellowship with Christ. See, the mystic proclaims to have the secret closest to God based upon their experience when it actually creates distance. Distance between the believer and Christ because they're focused on experience over Christ. Distance from the believer to the body of believers because it pushes them and separates them, elevating them when actually what happens is they're less spiritually mature, not more spiritually mature. Paul's not saying they're not a believer. He's saying, hey, your internet connection's gone off. You just don't realize it. You need to go check it. You need to go back and make sure it's hooked up. You need to make sure you're getting the right receptions. And everybody else knows that your internet connection is off. See, beware of chasing experience over the substance of the in him that he started in verse 9. The third distraction, the fourth on our list is that the Christian life is then, well, it must be about sacrifice. 
So if I can't figure out what to do in my brain, humanistic thinking, if it's not about what I, what I do, if it's not about my experience, if it's not about some sort of spiritual encounter with angels, it must be about what I have to give up. That's asceticism. I have to deprive myself. I have to make sure I have a difficult life. I have to make sure there's pain involved. And the more I suffer, the more deny myself. That means the greater I am, the closer I am to Christ, the more spiritually elevated and mature I am. It goes back to the idea that the Gnostics had that it influenced Colossae. I've mentioned this a number of times. They thought all matter, anything physical was evil, therefore only the spirit was good. Therefore, the body was the cause of all of our problems. And so what they said is what you have to do is you have to put controls on your body, and that's how you achieve holiness. You get to holiness by control, not by focusing on Christ. Paul addresses that in verse 20. It's written in what's called the first-class condition in the Greek language. It's, it's written in what's called, it gives an assumption of truth. He goes, hey, if you've died with Christ and have a new nature, which I'm assuming that you have, he's saying, we're assuming that you are, then you are a new creation, and he lives in you. So why in the world are you making an emphasis of the old nature? Why are you making an emphasis of the things of the world? Why are you going in and bringing in this earthly conversation? And he lists a bunch of those things in verse 21 and 22 that he calls the elementary principles or imposing the basic things of society from verse 20. You see, typically when we have a, a challenge as believers, we often go back to the solution I mentioned a few weeks ago that we go, well, the devil made me do it. Or, oh, the world made me do it. Or, well, my circumstances made me do it. It's, it's that we're no longer in control of sin. Does this one work? There you go. Sorry about that. Again, it's almost like the golfer I said uh, like a week ago that if you go golfing with me, I'm not a very good golfer, but if you go golfing with me and there's trees and there's water, in my brain I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to hit the trees today and I don't want to hit the water. I get up. I don't want to hit the trees. I don't want to hit the water. Nine times out of the ten, do you know what I do? I hit it in the trees or I hit it in the water because that's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about the thing that I don't want to do rather than the thing that I want to do. And often when I actually think, you know, today I'd like to hit it right down the middle of the fairway and make an easy approach shot so I can actually par this par four, rarely. But when I do that, nine times out of ten, I actually end up hitting it in the fairway. And that's the believer who goes around and they go, you know what, I don't want to curse anymore. And so I keep thinking about myself, I don't want to curse. And I put a big rubber band on my arm. And every time I curse, I'm going to flip myself. And I tell all my friends, if you hear me say a bad word, I want you to flip myself. And so all day long, they're coming around and they're popping me. Instead, I'm reinforcing the fact that I'm cursing, not reinforcing the fact that I'm a person who doesn't curse. Or it's the believer who goes, look, I don't want to gossip anymore. And they tell other friends, if you hear me gossiping, let me know. And all your friends are listening for the very thing that you don't want to do. So you, you, you flip the script on the thing you don't want to do. It's like that cake in the refrigerator that your wife says don't eat. It's for later, but she doesn't tell me what it is. And she's gone, and it's my day off, and I think about the cake all day long, and she's somehow surprised that half the cake's gone when she comes home. I don't understand that. Don't tell me what not to do, because then I want to do it, and I think about it all the time. And the believers in Colossae, they've gotten distracted. They're trying to punish the flesh. They're trying to go, oh, I've got to, I've got to discipline this way. The danger is, if that's what your focus is, we're always trying to control our sin. In verse 21, he says, you're focused on the things like don't handle, don't eat, don't touch. These commandments of what not to do. And they'd added legalism, Judaism to Christianity. They'd taken what the religious leaders had imposed and added to Christianity. And there's a problem in verse 23. And that is, they look spiritual, but they really have a heart issue. And again, the things themselves are not the issue. It's not about that you're actually eating or not eating. That doesn't matter. It's the focus. But I want to just listen to these examples of ways that people have depraved themselves and deprived themselves in order to be more spiritual in various religions. One Hindu looked at the sun until he was blind to show how spiritual he was. A Buddhist kept his hands above his head until they withered. During Ramadan, Muslims don't eat, drink, or have relations between sunrise and sunset. Some in looking for enlightenment have quit speaking altogether. Some have had wounds and allowed maggots to eat their flesh rather than flick them off. In Judaism, you couldn't spit on the Sabbath because your spittle could hit the ground, cause it to hit the dirt, create a little 
dirt ball, and that would be working on the Sabbath. Even in Old Testament times, when they worshiped idols and they got into some of those other gods, they would sometimes sacrifice their own children in order to make the gods help their crops grow more. See, true asceticism, if it's really about denial, it always leads to death. Because the best way to show how spiritual you are is to actually lose your life physically. Because if it's about the physical, what greater way to show how spiritual you are than to cause a physical end? Now, we do it in Christianity as well. I've heard of people that have 40-day fast. But you know what you're not supposed to know? Whenever anyone's on a 40-day fast, and yet they tell you, hey, I'm on a 40-day fast. That's why I'm not eating. And the focus is not on the thing itself, but the focus ends up being on them. Or they go, I'm going to sell everything I have. And you tell everybody why you're doing it. You let everybody know. Or you live a life of poverty and you look like it. Or you take on burdens that no one's ever asked you to take, but you keep heaping them on because you want to make sure you look like you're spiritual. And again, the things themselves are not the issue. It's about the focus. It's the reason, the heart behind it. And in Colossae, they've gotten distracted over what they do, how they abase their body. And yet in verse 23, Paul says, these things on their own have no value. They have no worth. They're empty. And they actually don't control the evil desire. They let you think about it even more. And it's funny, instead of trying to stop sinning, Paul says, and the Bible says, yield to Christ and you'll stop sinning. Isn't that interesting? Instead of thinking about don't sin, don't sin, don't sin, he goes, focus on Christ, focus on Christ, focus on Christ. And the end result is the more you have an ability to focus on Christ, the less you'll find yourself doing the things that you don't want to do. And these dangerous distractions pop up, and then we have a tendency to grab onto them and think there's some new formula in life when there's really not. It's really simple. It's about a fellowship relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ, Focusing on him, learning more about him, yielding to him, and those other things we'll find we just end up doing less and less because we reflect him more. So three applications. Number one, evaluate your life. Have you gotten distracted? If so, you need to refocus on Christ. So do a quick assessment this week. Maybe you've been distracted on a good thing. You're doing it. You're doing it legalistically, but you realize, you know what? I actually am doing it because I think I'm a better believer because I'm doing it. If that's you, you have gotten distracted. So if so, confess it. Just say, God, I realize I've gotten distracted. I'm to get back on track. You might need to stop the thing that you're doing, even though it's good. If you're highlighting the experience, quit talking about it. If you're focusing on stop doing the wrong things, stop that. Focus on Christ and do the right thing. Recalibrate yourself. Get your focus back on Christ. Number two, we have to go back to our foundation with Christ. Paul addressed these four misleading ways that we see in Christianity that have distracted believers in, in Colossae, and he gave the corrective summary. If you still have your Bibles open, glance back to chapter 2, verse 6. He said, therefore, as you have received Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk in the distractions. No, walk in him. It's as simple as, are you in him, with him, daily, daily. The answer to focusing on our spiritual growth is, are you walking with him? So go back to that foundation this morning. Remember who he is, what he's done for you. Walk with him. Spend time with him. Talk to him. Experience is only good when it's based in him. And then application number three. Practice a spiritual discipline this week with the purpose of knowing and loving Jesus Christ more. Again, a spiritual thing are things we do to intentionally focus on Christ. It's not something you do to prove that you're spiritual, okay? It's something we do to help us focus on Christ. And sometimes we need things to help kickstart our focus on Christ. For example, you say, all right, well, the discipline of studying Scripture is a good thing. But if I do it for every day for 30 minutes and become legalistic about it, I'm going to think that I'm growing, but I'm doing something out of legalism rather than doing something out of joy. I mean, it's actually okay if you miss a day. It's not going to kill you or your relationship with Christ. But you should make that a habit, right? Don't be legalistic about it. Make sure you're focused on him. So this week, you could do something simple. It might be just taking a walk on the beach, listening to the water, the oceans, taking a bush walk, listening to the birds, and thinking about the creation that is around you and how great God is, how a great God could create so many things that we can visibly see and audibly hear, and you end up focusing on him and how great our God is. 
Or maybe it's the, the discipline of prayer this week. Maybe you can use prayer while you're driving or prayer while you're walking to strengthen your fellowship with him. Not to be legalistic about it, but you're going to go, I like when I'm going to work on spiritual discipline. I'm not that good of a prayer, so I'm going to spend some time praying to my Savior. That might be a good thing. Or maybe it's the discipline of, of memorizing Scripture. You can engage with God in a greater way. Instead of using the excuse, I'm too old or I'm too young or I'm too in the middle or I don't really like doing that or I can't, try it. Start with the small one, right? Maybe start with maybe Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 that we just read. A very small little verse. Memorize that verse. Maybe that's what it is this week. And this is going to help you remind, all right, this is what I want to do. I'm going to walk in him. And here's the verse, Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. I'm going to walk in him. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. Start getting distracted. Go back to the word and your fellowship with him rather than what you're experiencing. So practice a spiritual discipline this week with the intention of knowing Christ more, not about the activity itself. Does that make sense? See, it doesn't take long to get distracted. It doesn't take long to look back on, hey, I'm spiritual based on what I do. That means who I am. Or, look, I've deprived myself. That means I'm more spiritual. Or I've had an experience, and that means I'm more spiritual. That doesn't amount to a hill of beans. And what Paul says, that's just a shadow of the thing. You're missing the very thing. Go back to being in him, and then your fellowship and your focus will change. Good? Challenge. Gracious Father, Lord, we thank you this morning for this opportunity to study your word. And Lord, we thank you that your word is active and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And Father, we uh, confess that we get distracted, not just the things of this world like our job and our family and life and hobbies, but even by things which look spiritual, which may even sound spiritual. Father, Lord, forgive us for that. Help us to refocus on you. And Lord, I pray that our relationship and our fellowship this week is about who you are and us learning to be in you, with you, uh, through you in all these things. And Lord, may this week we not be distracted as maybe we were the previous week. We pray this most precious and holy name. Amen.